right into another dirt hole. Hello and welcome to the shop. I'm Jared and this is the Questionable Garage. And today we're a bit echoey because we are in a barn standing next to two classic American icons. We have a pair of Ford Mustangs that have been sitting at least this one since 1982. And from what I understand, the one behind it, very close to it. 40 plus years sitting in a barn covered in dust. I've seen these things, I've walked past these things, and I've been dying to try to revive them. Now, I'm not looking to revive these for me and to build them on the channel. We have got plenty of projects, and I'm not a Ford Mustang guy. I absolutely love their history and their heritage, but they're not for me. They are very beautiful cars, especially when you go way back. Sorry, Fox Buddy guys, but look at this. Like, it's, it, your car's not, it's cool, but it's not Gen 1 Mustang cool. Now, if you haven't been able to identify just yourself quite yet, we've got a 1968 and a 1967 hard top, some column coupes. Now, if these were fastbacks, someone probably would have pried these out of here a long time ago. The fastbacks are super desirable. I, I kind of like the way the hard top looks. Personally, the, the fastbacks kind of, everyone's done one. Now, you may be asking yourself, how could some viewers just immediately identify and say, oh yeah, that's a 68 and that one's a 67. Well, one, 67, they got a little bit bigger from the earlier generations. I think it grew almost an inch in every direction. Two, they no longer said Mustang directly on the hood. And 68s, you're gonna tell by having the reflectors in the side of the body panels. And the 67, you've got those two plastic inserts in the side vents where the 68s don't have that. Now, another just kind of fun little bit of Mustang history. Most people credit Lee Iacocca with being the father of the Mustang. And while he did handle most of the corporate spearheading to make it happen, Gail Hauderman is the father of the Mustang, at least its design. He was kind of doodling and working at home on what he envisioned a sports car a muscle car to be because at work they were too busy designing the big bodied Fords. So give Gail the credit he deserves. My goal is to get both of them hopefully fired up and running in one episode. The very first thing we need to do is we need to try to get it away from the wall a little bit. Gonna jack them up, try to get some air in these tires, make sure each wheel moves, and we're just gonna pull them out kind of in the middle of the barn alley. That's gonna give me enough room to kind of walk around them, try to get these hoods open, get inside them, see what we have and what 40 years of sitting in a covered barn has done to them, and then try to get them running. Now, I will say one thing that's kind of working on our side is we've got bias ply tires. Somehow, they leak even when new, but they always tend to air up, hopefully. Now, you may also be asking, Jared, how are you so confident you're gonna be able to get them running? Well, that is because I was able to talk to the owner. You're not always able to find out histories of cars that have been just sitting and forgotten about. But from what the stories were, one was basically kind of the hot rod toy and the other one was the regular driver. Well, looking at the one up front with the big tires and the shackles on the rear leaf springs, this was probably the toy and the one in the back was the regular driver. But children came along Mustangs didn't have a very practical seat to put kids in and out of, so they both just got parked. That's the memory. Now, obviously, things could be very different from that, and we may have a ton of problems and may not be able to get them running, but we are going to get them out of the barn and onto a new life. So buckle up, grab some popcorn and your favorite drink, and let's see what we've got going on behind us and uh, if we're gonna be successful or not. Barn finds, you know, if it's like this was Forza, you just walk away and magically they're repaired. Now I've had the best luck when trying to air up tires is to go ahead and lift the car to try to get some of the weight off of them. Oh, give me something good, Jack. Oh. Oh. Also, we want to get them up to see if they're going to turn. Because if they're not going to turn, we're going to have to go grab a bunch of tools real quick. So, we're not going to turn. That would be too easy, right?
Hey, we got dirt falling off the bottom. Hey, we're taking up some air. We're gonna have fun getting these rolling, I feel like. Oh, but we're gonna have to fight this one wheel at a time. I mean, who's surprised? It's been 40 years, right? <laughs> With some springs, coil spacers in the front end, and it still was rubbing. Well, let's go get some tools. Oh, hey guys, just ran up from the barn to grab some tools before we head back out to that pair of Mustangs. Now, you may not realize this, but Mother's Day is fast approaching. And while you're probably not gonna be able to get her a pair of Mustangs for Mother's Day, you know what you can get her? A pair of the everyday earbuds from our sponsor, Raycon. That's right, I bet mom would absolutely love a set of the everyday earbuds. They have two modes while you have them in your ear. You have noise isolating, so that way if dad's watching the kids, you wanna tune out, enjoy a podcast, your music, whatever, your favorite questionable garage video, it's gonna help keep that noise away from you. They also operate in awareness mode, letting you enjoy your music or podcast or questionable garage video and let you hear what's going on around you. Now, I love these things so much, I have switched pretty much exclusively to use these things from the old little white hammer looking things that come from a very expensive phone manufacturer. I found the sound quality to be better, they're way more comfortable in my ear, and because they are so affordable, if I manage to break them, it doesn't break my heart. Seriously guys, these things come in at half the price, and you've got color options. Others don't offer that. And making sure your everyday earbud has the perfect fit is easy as they all come with five pairs of silicone gel tips. And of course, no earbud is complete without simple to use buttons built into them to answer calls, to skip to the next track, turn the volume up, and simple to understand controls. Another great benefit of gifting the everyday earbuds from Raycon is their 30 day return policy. If you happen to have a brother or sister as you know thoughtful and wonderful as you for giving mom a set of these earbuds, it makes returning the duplicate gifts easier. And of course, they're gonna be the ones that have to think again because you thought of it first. Now, I am supposed to you know show you close-ups of my earbuds, but I legitimately have been using these for months. You don't wanna see the close-up of you know little bits of earwax that have left behind. So Dwayne's gonna insert some beautiful B-roll of uh, clean pairs. Now, if you're ready to get your mom the ultimate Mother's Day gift or get yourself something just because you do deserve it, click the link in the description box below or head on over to buyraycon.com slash questionable. You're gonna save 20% off your first Raycon purchase and get free shipping. Again, should be a little title card here, description box down below, ultimate Mother's Day gift, ultimate gift for yourself. It doesn't matter. You're not gonna be disappointed. Link in the description below. <sighs> Silly me, wishful thinking. that, you know, put air in it and it start turning. I mean, that's to be expected, it's rusty. Surprisingly, the brake hose does not look as terrifying as I would have expected it to look. That's, that's not gonna be an option. And so those four bolts and the whole spindle comes off or the whole backing plate. The good news is it's only eight to get done. Normally you can like, be excited that you're only doing four. We got two cars. For yeah. All right, more tools. Ugh. All right, since, you know, it's being a car that's been stuck for 40 years, uh, we're gonna have to get in and do the tricky. So first things we're gonna pull the nut. I'm hoping this holds your hub on that your brake drum lives on. Behind that is your backing plate that holds the brake shoes. 
and I'm hoping the nuts or the bolts on those are captive because you can easily access all the nuts. Ow, that's a thorn. There's lots of vegetation that's grown through this poor thing. Wondering if it did some time in a field before it got to come under the barn. That would explain all the locked up stuff a little bit more too. Should find out if the breaker loose or 5,000. Ow, thorn. That Derek and I used on that Ford van is still around. Now you don't quite have the same tricks in the rear. The way the axles and stuff are designed. So you just generally end up having to be a lot more rough with those. Another thing I'm gonna do is just get this bearing out. Come on. Might give me enough wiggle to get the shoes to come loose. Now we could do what we did in the rear on the Ford before, is you can break those pins that hold your shoes down and then grab a puller and the shoes will come right with this. I might actually do that. That was like the most effective I've ever been at removing these. Is you take a flat punch, break those two off, and see how it's already. That's just the shoes are stuck really good. We'll do that. I'll be right back. As you can see, I just take that punch, a little bit of a sharp point to it. You can dry my back for a second because I gotta gotta be where you are. Now you're still gonna fight all the hardware on top and you're, this is basically guaranteeing you need to redo all this stuff, but realistically, if it's been sitting for 40 years, you should probably be redoing all that stuff anyway. Come on. Stop being a butthead. Come on, you girl. All right, we're pulling the, trying to pull the wheel cylinder. Give us a little bit more room. <sighs> uh, finally, maybe. I just had to uh, get very, very rough with it and accept we'll be doing, ow. If we get it running down the road, we're just doing all the brake hardware. Kind of feel like lately, even like Derek just <laughs> starts with all new brake stuff. It's way too important and, uh, you know, safety side of things. I remember the van we did together, we had to protect the drums because there's just literally no option for replacement drums. This with the Mustang, there's options. We can get parts. Basically, once we get it off, we'll pull all the brake hardware, put this back on, and we have a rotating wheel. There we go, come on. You're coming. Probably doesn't help that this is like brand new brake shoes practically. It'd be so much easier if they were mostly worn out brake shoes. And you see what causes it. Moisture gets in there and it rusts up. And potentially if we drug it a whole lot, it might break free. Yeah, this all looks like it got brand new brake hardware and then parked and then rusted up just perfectly to ruin our day. It does make me want to just see if maybe we can get by with breaking some loose and not having to go through that on every single one. Should I grab the actual tools for this or just, ow. Come on. There we go. Now, I do need to remember not to go try and stand on the brakes <laughs> when we go to move this thing. So we gotta get these things free from the barn. They're in the way. Now we're just gonna get drug around. <sighs> yep, 
Yay. Okay. It's not that bad. I know what to go in expecting. So we can do this a little quicker, I hope. You guys saw the process in a little more detail this time. Obviously the drum is going to be a little unhappy. We had to beat it up pretty hard. Now we can roll it and not drag it and risk damaging things, which is my biggest worry right now. But I've made it this far. Don't break them now. Upon closer inspection, I'm pretty much 100% certain our 68's the hot rod. We got the cool, probably Monroe. It's got a little extra springs in it. Back here, no axle back exhaust. Taking a look at the floor pan, it looks pretty good. I mean, we'll see once it's fully out. Surprise, locked up. And by surprised, I mean none of you are even remotely surprised. But we're gonna do that same trick. Jack stand. Let's see if I can see. Ugh. All right, point it to my finger. Right here are those pins for your brakes. If you remember, you have the small spring and the two cups, and this is what holds on to them. When you're fighting a super, super heavily rusted brake, again, take that flat punch, knock the cap of that off, and it's gonna let your shoes kind of flare in and out a little bit, and it makes removing rusted up stuff a whole lot better. Haven't even tried putting air in that yet. 75%, it'll take it. But let's get back to work. Well, let's see if it'll roll that way. And then I can do that whole thing one more time. <sighs> well, that front's still a little low. We're not gonna talk about the interior yet either until we do that tour. I'm just trying to get it into neutral, okay? Vehicle this old is not going to have steering locks. And there we go. Right into another dirt hole. This one there. inches I need more air and something with with power to move it holy cow huh <sighs> it moved I just I had to refill the left front a little bit more that's kind of a cool look like muscle cars with a whole bunch of patina dirt look cool there was a lot of junk underneath it and we get to do it <laughs> one more time and then we're finally gonna get the reward of, you know, like going through the car, seeing what the interior is like, what's in the trunk, what the engines are like, if they're even gonna turn over or not. Oh. So uh, I'm just gonna time lapse the second car, cause let's be honest, you only need to see me rolling around in the dirt and grunting and complaining a couple times. R Dwayne can put a really fun music track behind the rest of it and uh, we'll get, our 67 rolled out the same way so we can then comfortably work around them because I'm a big guy and uh, that's, that's not a lot of working space there. No, no it isn't. I can see now why Derek, Vice Grip Garage, does the entire, just send out a new set of tires and wheels for a revival. Because that's where you lose a lot of time. When we did the van, we planned ahead and had tires, but the rims still leaked and caused a whole lot of problems. What I've gone through, five and a half hours of driving around to finally get four tires for the 67 to hold air, 
The 68 over the weekend, the fronts went flat, so I picked them up, pumped them full of slime, re-aired them up, and spun them around. I prefer slime over fix-a-flat. Um, my experience is it reacts with the aluminum less. But I came back to some fun. We got all our tires, four very different sizes. We got a Cooper Cobra. We got a Sincera from Falcon. We got a Cordo van, steel belted. Um, and then a Prime Well, Prime Well, down under there. It's gonna look interesting. They're gonna hold air. But I came back after this morning, running around to pick things up and discovered, it's, it's calm right now, but the wind is blowing and this is like a uh, wind tunnel. It blew everything over. The Got just enough gust of air that the jack stand collapsed. Thankfully, no damage to the car. It's just gonna be an even bigger pain in the butt to get it up again and get tires on it. Slide it in neutral, we're gonna push it out just like the 68, and then discover. Is there a key? key back here? There's no way I'm getting in through this door. Why is it locked? Is there, okay, all right, all right. Wait, will it up out? Well, I'm going to pull the inside handle. Or can I get to the window crank? Ow. That's sharp. Good thing there's another Mustang to look at. All right, it's both like here. Let's go for the window crank first. Oh, I can touch it. Oh, come on. Big beefy arms are not good right now. I can feel it. Oh. What I'd give for someone with tiny arms right now. Oh, okay. Will that lock it? No, door handle wall. Okay. It's starting to go down. Okay, come on, gentle. Well, the good news is it's not a broken, it's not locked, it just is broke. Some more power. Oh, what can we hook it to? Alright, now I gotta get it far enough over for the truck. So dirty. I'm looking forward to these not being so dirty. if you can see the dust it keeps blowing up pretty substantially like i said this is a uh, nice little wind tunnel here but we have both mustangs pulled out we had to uh, kind of push this window down to get into the shifter 
We're not gonna look at that one first. Again, this, this guy behaved, the 68 was the first one out. So this is the one we're gonna explore, take a look at. I'm gonna say, I love Derek's philosophy. You start in the back. If you find a whole engine back there, you're not gonna be in for a very good time. And then, unlike our 67 friend, uh, we still got a key there. Is it the right key? I do believe that's the right key. Uh, I don't know. Come on. Nope. All right, well, into the trunk we go. Okay, trunk springs are gone. There's not a whole bunch of engine parts here, which is always good. We got one tag. You know, 10 for good buddy. Initial look does not appear to be completely rotted out yet. Get it cleaned up real good. There's something cool about the barn finds, but they're also can be very disgusting. So if we come in here, <laughs> there's not much to see. You can see your 68 steering wheel and 68, I think they called this the safety wheel. A two-spoke wheel, you're more likely to, I guess, bend it when you crash. You got your wiper switch. You got a Mustang there to remind you what you're driving. And then just look at the heater controls. Defrost, temperature, fan speed, heat blend, light switch, parking. They just don't make cars pretty anymore, you know? I believe this is either your manual choke or a fresh air vent pull. I'm not a hundred hundred percent down here. Or maybe that's your fresh air pedal. You know, random vacuum line. Oh, I mean, technically we don't really need a key on this old of a car, but it is nice to have it. Also, you can tell it's 68 because it's the first of the three point harnesses. Rear speakers are not much left to do. We got the rear windows. Do we dare test it? Uh, up. Okay, it's trying to move. I think we'll wait until we can clean it and grease it a little bit. The rubbers are definitely shot, headliner. Starting to give up the ghost. You know, the Mustang is very much a pretty car. You got this big old center console. You got buttons. Or no, those are gear position lights. This is rubber floor mat is just exploding under any movement. Ah, oh, we got ourselves a radio. Little, that's kind of cool. I mean, a little roll up door storage bin. I appreciate that. Ugh. Club box check is easy. It's uh, missing. And then we've got some uh, metal stove pipe. Also, I'm gonna venture to guess I'd say red was not our original color here. I think she was a white Mustang repainted a red. I mean, red's a little bit more exciting, but it's hard to say for sure. Now, this is, this is where I'm expecting to run into problems. Got this beautiful hood. Again, I think it was 67. They quit putting Mustang across it. The green really pops. But um, who says that latch doesn't work? It's a double release. Okay, we get a pop. No, God, you're popping. I'm just, I'm curious. We're gonna have this much fun on both of them. Just trying to get in the hoods. Come on, 67. Oh, you feel even worse. Wait, come on. Putting you down one second, guys. Come on. Go. Oh. Come on, you're making noises. Oh. Oh. It's quiet for right now, but the roof is trying to lift off. But we got the hood open, and we are able to take a look. Yeah, she's been sitting for quite a while. I was taking a look at our battery cables. Of course, you've got the red ground. 
and your red positive. Best thing about Ford, they make it really easy to test these cars. You can just easily jump and try to run the starter right there. I'm not sure that that hose is even close to trying to hold fuel anymore. So we'll need to address that. Something else we're gonna need to address. I'm not even gonna try to open it until we at least vacuum, but I suspect we're gonna need to take this carb up with us and give it a good cleaning. These are super simple engines. Back in the day, you have points. That's your ignition system. So inside here, we're gonna have some points. See, how does the rest of it look? That looks like pretty much fresh ignition parts. A Little bit of burning there, but right here are your points. Your point contactor, right? There, and what this does, if you see how that looks like a hexagon, and you see how that's opening and closing as we rotate. Well, every time this breaks and reconnects, it fires your ignition coil, which then sends your spark down the center of your distributor, and wherever that rotor button is facing, travels down there to the outside to one of your spark plug wires and down to your spark plug. So most likely what happens to these things after they sit for a long time is you just get a little bit of fuzz and corrosion on those points. You can just see how dirty those look. They should be nice and shiny. So we're just gonna come in with a gentle file, clean that up a little bit so that way it'll be able to hopefully break and reconnect the ignition correctly. And then beyond that, Everything's pretty much here. Obviously, at some point, it probably had a heater core leak. Judging by the cut hoses and, you know, the loop up here at the front of the engine. So, wait. I'm all excited. I told you guys how, you know, the distributor works, what we need to do there, what we need to do to the carburetor. I don't even know if this turns over. You know, things that have been sitting a long time. <gasps> all right, we're turning. All right, a little belt slip there. We're rotating backwards. Oh. Rotor button turning. Oh. Okay, that, that's encouraging. All right, so it really was probably running when it was parked. Now we can go back to uh, vacuuming that a little bit, seeing if the went quiet. See if that carb is gonna play games. Not play games. So I guess we'll start vacuuming up and then we still have a whole other Mustang to look at. While I was in hood opening mode, I just, I went ahead and opened the hood on that one too. Is any right so I'm gonna you know give that a shot don't know how likely it is to work <sighs> all right battery is hooked up and we're gonna come see what the key does I'm actually here just from all right nothing out of that we are in park all right key to on something made a noise it sounds like it's trying to do the starter solenoid, but that sounds done for. Lights, don't pull it or in or out. Any other indication that we have life in here? No. Okay, well, we'll go to the manual button pusher. Hey, <laughs> so it is good. not sound gallopy which is good who would have thought a car that sat for many many years is going to have electrical problems i mean the drive belt's almost completely tore through but it is turning over also kind of a hot topic 
when it comes to ether, it's going to wash any presence of oil off your cylinder walls. When you're trying to resurrect something that's been sitting for a really long time, your cylinder walls are dry. See, the last thing you really want to do is put anything in there that's going to really dry out all potential lubrication. You need to have some lubrication, otherwise, especially on old rings, they're going to score and damage real quickly. So I, when I'm pouring something down the gullet, I prefer it to be a premix, 50 to 1, 40 to 1, whatever. But it's a little more expensive. If you want to mix it yourself, you can save a lot of money that way. I like this because it's ethanol free. But you do want to put some type of premix in there. And thanks to the wind, we have put it everywhere. And only somewhere where we wanted. Come on, come on, come on. Oh, come on, come on, come on, come on. Okay, that was too much. I'm getting hit in the head by rust. All right, we're gonna give her a little more gas. Apparently when Derek pours half a gallon down and jokes about it being just enough, it's not that much of a joke. It's alive. Okay, so uh, now we're gonna put fuel lines in and see if uh, the fuel pump will try to pick up a little bit. All right, so we've got rough lines replaced. Something really encouraging is when I removed that little bit of hose going to the factory tank, it had old gas in it, which means the pump most likely has stayed wet. Anytime a diaphragm pump gets dry, they can pretty, easily go bad that's why you so often see on revivals they just go to a click clack but we're running to an auxiliary fuel cell that was given to me i promise i didn't steal it we're going to pour a little bit more down the throat of that carburetor and see if it will uh, pick up and run off the pump i also blew through and no the seat's not stuck closed it's at least letting fluid get into the carb we may run into it being stuck and having to turn it off pretty quickly. We will see. Come on. Come on. stuck. Okay. Sometimes you can just hammer those back down. Um, that was not appearing to be the case. So what that is, is the seat, the float, is stuck and not closing. But our fuel pump's pumping and our engine is running. So I just got to figure out, it might be easiest to just lift the hat and risk that gasket and we can get the float moving. Carb's filling, it's just the float's not closing. So I ran up and got the float and seat cleaned up. Um, I'm worried the float might not be floating very well. Uh, it's something we'll find out for sure. Maybe this time, because the seat is sticking. I know exactly where to hit it this time. We're not getting fuel anymore. Or we lose something else. 
It's one of those things. This thing was parked when it wasn't awful gasoline, but that still doesn't mean it's going to work. That's a lot of painful things flying around. quite ready to idle but uh it's running i think it wants to be back to life considering how little it's fighting or am i speaking too soon well good morning uh if you notice that carb still looks pretty much as dirty as it did yesterday well for some reason nobody has four barrel autolite ford carb kits in stock for any Reasonable period of time. I couldn't get four barrel or two barrel for our uh, other Mustang in the back there. And I'm fairly certain the fuel pump just gave out on this. It was almost too easy. You know, you can't just fire all the points and have it fire right back up. But we know this engine does indeed run. The other thing we're running into is that these two need to be out of the barn today. I really wanted to drive this one out. We may just have to re-air up those front tires and pull this one out. Don't have brakes anyway. We don't have very far to go, but again, I want them running and we need to get them clean. The two big reasons behind that is those are some of the biggest things that stop motivation. An absolutely filthy car that you can't let your kids around that you wanna give the cars to eventually, um, and they don't run. So if we can make that happen, those are the two biggest hurdles. Hopefully these things can uh, get a little bit more love. So. Still going to order a carb kit, but we're going to have to uh, get it moved before we can get into that too much. So let's go back here. I got a morning coffee sitting here, but we do now have the doors open so we can uh, take a full walk around of our 67. Still no keys for it. The owner is looking for it. This is the car like of the two that that one just came into life. This was kind of his childhood, him telling the stories the accidents, the trouble that he got into in this car. He was changing out the transmission at one point and it actually fell off the blocks that all four tires are sitting on. And the transmission and floor jack gave him enough room to escape out from underneath it. He had just put this real nice black paint on it and then had an accident, rebuilt it. This is probably the one that has a little more sentimental value. But yeah, we are inside the car now. I did not completely relatch the door. <sighs> Everything needs a lot of grease and lube. But we were trying to figure out, he remembered this being called a California edition. I thought California editions were only 68, but I'm not gonna claim to know a lot about Mustangs, but three spoke steering wheel, everything else makes it clear. This is indeed a 67, but we've got the roof console there and slightly different plastic inserts around in the back. But look at all of your knobs. This is an AC car judging by that. Again, just really cool dash, that same little flip up. They just don't make cars pretty anymore. Got some shag carpet going. Um, head gaskets in the car, I'm not gonna say are a guaranteed bad thing, but it certainly is not something you want to see. You know, always travel with a spare. This is a Mustang, it's not a, uh, 7m what else do we got back here cord board some pharmacy calendar let's see here that is a church flyer from january 25th 1981 <laughs> so yeah she's probably been sitting here since 1981 
not the best of interior, but beauty is it's a Mustang. You can actually get parts for these things. Oh, look, <laughs> we got ourselves an aftermarket oil pressure gauge, temperature, charge. Oh, there is an oil pressure gauge from the factory there. We got gasoline. I believe that's a clock in the center. 27,557, odds are roll over. I'd say pretty high. All right, I got that unlatched while we were fighting the other one. Ah, there we go. Top spark plug wires. We have got some vines here. Look at that. Oh, don't break the wire. All right, so coming up here, this is a 289, a little bit smaller than our other one. It does not have a fuel line on it. We do have some form of battery cable, a brush, ether, tape, another starting solenoid. That one got broke off. Ranch it, a file, you know, just the usual things. We will just do a power jumper where we will give the coil our own 12 volt so we can start it and stop it as we see fit. Whew, these cables are rough, I'll need to remember that. Oh, speaking of rough, what is this carb holding for us? Well, that's good news. That's covered. And that actually looks pretty clean. How does it move? All right, full range of motion, trickle B. Why is the fuel pump currently bypassed? So we'll have to try to get those fuel lines on. How does inside our distributor look? It looks like someone was trying to get these going at some point. So same thing, we're gonna give those points a little bit of a file over there, get them cleaned up. We need to make sure it turns. That would make sense too, Jared. Is that spinning? Can't tell. Okay. That one turns too. Thanks for looking up close for me. I couldn't quite see. All right, well, let me connect the fuel lines and all those things and we will put power to this one too and see what happens. Got a lot smaller ground, so I'm expecting slower cranks, but let's see. Yep. There's some bangs and clangs. Make sure you get all the straw fully coated too. All right, I feel like she is not sparking for us. Another look at her points. We get fuel yet? No. This could need a condenser, could need a whole lot of things. That's a lot of grossness coming out of there. Kind of see all that white. The corrosion we're getting off the points. Nothing. Nothing, nothing, nothing. So, um, good thing for the internet. I just couldn't remember positive and negative crispy crossities. not even trying. I can't think of anything else without the key. <sighs> Running out of battery and time. So we pulled the 
I swapped condensers. I borrowed the coil from the car we knew ran. Still would no, no spark, no spark, no spark. So I pulled the points completely off and let's just say they were very, very corroded. So we spent some time cleaning them off car. And now I feel pretty confident. I don't know if I should, but I do. And okay. oh, yep, here comes the acorns and the rust. I don't know if it needs more, but we'll try giving it more. Okay, do we call that a win? Fire out the intake, that's a win. is excited it is wash day for these two cars 40 years of dust and buildup and grossness sitting in a barn and we're about to remove it all quick order of attack we are going to just hit compressed air and try to blow all of the looseness off then we're going to come through we're going to soap it and let that soap break it down i know it would be most satisfying and part of me really just wants to do it to just take the pressure washer right across and we may do that in some areas where the paint's a little bit tougher but the side that was close to the barn walls on both the cars there's not a lot of paint there so we can't just really bear down hard with a pressure washer obviously these things are going to need paint they're going to need body work but we're trying to make them look as great and exciting as possible to motivate those next stages of the project i've got bags shoved down the carburetors we are going to be pulling those off and fully rebuilding them once we get them clean, it's just, I can't wait anymore to clean them. I'm legitimately did not sleep much last night because I was that excited to uh, see what's underneath all this dust. Hopefully there's still a car when it's all gone.
All right, let's get these things popped apart. So this is the 289's two barrel carburetor. You see just two small throttle plates, two barrels. And then this is the 302's four barrel. You have primaries and secondaries. The way the secondaries on this one opens up is via vacuum. A certain amount of vacuum, you change your weight here and that will pull and open the leads to let airflow down to the lowers. But right now, everything is gummed up terribly. My guess is once things started moving around, especially in the four barrel, things clogged very quickly because we had a little bit of movement initially from it. But yeah, my guess is this is gonna come up and the bowl is just gonna be slapped full of garbage. That's my prediction. We're going to bust out the ultrasonic here in a little bit too. That's always a cool thing. I love that tool. Come on, choke, let go. Thank you. Flip all our screws out. I'm considering our metering jets definitely look completely clogged. So this is your float. Fuel comes in here. And when this is down, your seat comes off the base and fuel can come in and then once your float comes up, closes that off. So that initial fuel spraying out the top and everywhere was because this was sticking on us. Again, not really surprising that it would happen. If you look, completely clogged off, plugged off. We have got dirt and rust built up there all right and then you can see all that crust at the bottom all that junk started breaking loose and plugging up everything even more i think a real good cleaning and all the gaskets we can for it i mean that's exactly what you want in your fuel bowl yeah <laughs> Basically, if it needs to be open, it's not. If something was supposed to flow through it, it just, it can't. She is a dirty, dirty carb. Let's see, how's that showing up? Just caked up, clogged up. There's so many tiny little precise holes that aren't holes. One more part out of this and then we'll take apart the next one. Now, let's look at our two barrel friend. Substantially fewer yeah, screws on the top. Much simpler float. I mean, I guess that can be expected, right? Oh, I see. Okay, there's a tension spring. 
That'll come out a little easier. You can actually see through that one. I think if the fuel pump was pumping on this one, they had a chance of uh, running on this one, maybe. I found my cons most consistent success is just take apart a carb, clean carb, reinstall carb. And it works like 20% of the time. Dirty, but not awful. The 302's carb, the four barrel, that thing just qualifies as awful everywhere. All right, well, I'll get this part. We'll pick you guys right back up once I get my fresh distilled water and uh, have uh, have it warmed up and we're ready to start cleaning these things. Because otherwise I'm just, it's a little bit of fidgety stuff here and there. We're gonna try to save Dwayne some time and make it so he has a little bit less footage to edit. Those with really strong hearing, you can hear that thing buzzing away. We are working on getting the four barrel clean. Fresh water and solvent in there, heating up. Washing this by hand. Mostly when you're servicing a carburetor, sometimes you're soaking there, soaking there, rinsing there, hand scrubbing. It's a whole lot of like do three things and then wait 20 minutes and then do three more things and then wait again, so. We're in the, the waiting phase. Yep. We're still cleaning between that and that. Little scrapers. We're doing pretty good. We're getting almost everything cleaned up. The two barrel is looking absolutely amazing. Our four barrel, what we're fighting with is first off, that hole there is what would fill the accelerator pump. And that was completely clogged nothing at all was coming through there that took a lot between soaking in the barrenmans and the uh <sighs> ultrasonic with some scraping and air and we finally got that cleared up a big old chunk came flying out <laughs> pretty much every passage appears to be doing good our booster's coming out that hole there i can't directly chase but i am getting fluid through it so I feel like we're gonna be good there. We're gonna run this one more time, even though it's looking really good. Um, give that one more wash. Top side here, all of those that were once completely clogged, they're now flowing freely. We gotta change that one O-ring out, but this will get one more final rinse. Oh, and then we can start building carburetors and get our Mustangs running again. Uh, you know, there's just a whole lot of cleaning and cleaning and cleaning that I just got through to show you guys this exciting moment. It's idling. Ain't absolutely perfect, but uh, small, small fuel leak again. years we got two pretty happy mustangs they need brakes we're gonna clean them up just a little bit more before we uh pass them off but i feel like it's hard to not be excited about both of these cars now it runs so let's see if it can drive now remember we've got no brakes that one works with a key this is currently our key here Power to the coil, give it a couple pumps, and All right. now Mustangs are known for a very roomy interior. <laughs> this is gonna be problematic. I gotta try to make the seat move. I'll pick you up in a second. Seat won't move. 
we're, we're doing good. Mustang moved. Um, you maybe saw it a little bit on the GoPro. I'm glad I had both hands going on. Because in the process of moving, reverse went from not working to suddenly working incredibly well, and the throttle return spring came off. So we suddenly had an extremely high idle with no brakes, reverse. I tried putting in a drive, nothing was happening. And you know, we have only expensive stuff behind us. So steered us around a little bit, threw it into park and it did come to a nice stop. I'm blown away that reverse worked. I probably should have checked, you know, transmission fluid levels earlier. It was bone dry, but somehow reverse worked. And all of my experience with automatic transmissions is with no fluid, you get drive, you don't get reverse because that's the highest pressure gear and everything like that. So I don't know, added some fluid to it. We haven't tried again yet. Uh, Cause unlike the red car with internal keys and a way to shut it off and start it from inside, I have to disconnect that wire. Maybe I run a string so I can yank it off in case of an emergency. Because my goal is to drive this to its its new garage where it will uh, start getting some love. Look at it. That poor thing trapped away. And probably the saddest thing, parked in 1981 for a family vehicle. You went from driving that to a Chevette that's a hard thing to give up, but that's, uh, we can do math, 43 years not running, being drug around, and just kind of forgotten. And now, it runs, it drives in reverse uncontrollably, you can't stop it, it still looks absolutely amazing. And we'll soon be back on the road. We got to jump start it, and uh, we still have one more to go. We still gotta get that uh, to start moving under its own power. Runs great, we just gotta get it to move and we'll hopefully drive that, you know, to its new, uh, new garage as well, next to that guy. Well, there you have it. We have got two Mustangs back out into the pasture, just like God intended. They should not be kept up in the barn for 40 years. Now, this is a very different type of revival. Like I stated at the beginning, we're not looking for any more project cars for the channel long-term. We have got plenty of them. And as cool as a 67 and a 68 Mustang would be, they're not staying with the channel. The whole point of this, we weren't doing the traditional, we're gonna revive it, do all the brakes, make it perfectly marginally road worthy and go on a several hundred mile drive. Never the point of this. The owner of these cars have always made it very clear. He's got two Mustangs, he's got two grandkids. These were big parts of his life and he wants to keep them in the family and get them excited about it. But unfortunately, if they're stuck in a barn, unable to roll on flat tires, covered in inches of dust that make no noise at all, it's hard to be excited about it. So the whole point and goal was one, to get these things moved. That barn needed some work and they couldn't stay where they were at. And rather than just having them unceremoniously drug around, I jumped at the opportunity to actually get them rolling. And kind of as an added bonus, we didn't just get them rolling, we got them running and moving under their own power. Now they don't stop and it's a little bit sketchy, but they've driven for the first time in 40 years. We confirmed their bones are good. The main 
body of the cars are solid and good. The engine works, the transmission works. They need brake work. They need the interiors cleaned. We didn't go through the full interiors, mainly because he wanted to be able to do that and kind of clean up and have a little less daunting of a task um, to get these things ready for the grandkids. They need cooling system, they need brakes, they need fuel system, but the big major parts work and I was thrilled to be a part of it. I've had a ton of fun in my career, even before YouTube, building different cars, but there's just something about this particular project, knowing the meaning, the history behind the cars and being able to help continue that legacy. It ranks up at probably two of my favorite things to wrench on. And again, it didn't take a ton of wrenching. Don't be afraid to try to tackle your own revival. We got the engine running by filing points, rebuilding carburetors and putting new fuel pumps on them. We got it rolling by removing the brakes. Now this is one spot where I can give you a little bit of a tip. If you know you're gonna park a car for a long time and it's got drum brakes, go ahead and back those drums all the way in so they're not sitting near your brake drums and they're not gonna rust solid and you're gonna be able to keep them rolling that's gonna save you a lot of headache down the road. You're still gonna run into problems with the hydraulics. You're gonna have stuff rust and lock up. That's unavoidable. But we know everything this needs to be able to go down the road and it's really exciting. And probably the best word of advice that I can ever give you that if you find a car sitting in a barn, sitting tucked against a house, an owner is kind of reluctant about possibly selling, don't bother them about it. Make, make yourself known, let them know your number, let them know the type of home you plan to give the car. Because most likely if someone's hanging on to it, it has a value sometimes well beyond any monetary number. So if you honestly legitimately can tell them you plan to give a car a forever home, why it's significant to you, let them know, but don't bother them and keep saying, sell me your car, you're ruining it. Because they'll never sell you the car and it will slowly go away. And it may end up in the hands of someone who doesn't have that same love or passion or care that you do. Now I'm hoping to do a couple more of these things, project car kickoffs, where we don't take it all the way to the finish line, we just get the ball rolling. And I already have the next one of those acquired. It's something we're gonna get out, try to get running, but we're not gonna build. And it's gonna make perfect sense why I'm not keeping it when we do finally get to that one. We've still got plenty to go. We've got tons of cool projects going on and a lot of really cool stuff lined up. So if you enjoy this stuff, subscribe, hang out. We do a little bit of everything from some tool reviews, project car revivals, very questionable choices, very questionable projects, and generally just try to have fun. And I love to teach a little bit, share what knowledge I have, and just have fun hanging out in the shop. So if you wanna see more of that type of shenanigans and just general, you know, fun car stuff, make sure you're subscribed to the channel, share it with your friends if you think it's worth it. It helps me out a ton when you guys are able to do that. It lets the algorithm know that people are enjoying it and shows it to more people so we can grow and continue to do fun things like reviving other people's cars that I had a whole lot of fun getting to do, knocking the dust off and seeing just what we had underneath in these bones. But. I appreciate you guys, as always, hanging out with us in the pasture while we do some very questionable things and sometimes some very not questionable things like getting a pair of Mustangs running to hopefully get the next generation of hot rodders excited and into the hobby. I'm Jared reminding you guys to always make questionable choices and uh, don't drive cars without brakes. I didn't film the black one coming over, but that, that, was, that was pretty scary. <laughs> we'll see you next time.